Well, good morning. My name is Adam. If uh, we haven't met, I'm part of the team here at Oasis, and it's great to be with you today and to open up this passage from God's Word. You know, history is littered with famous showdowns, with famous head-to-head contests, and they come in all different forms. Uh, Many of them, of course, are sporting contests. Uh, Maybe you think of the thriller in Manila, Uh, If you're around back then, Muhammad Ali versus Joe Frazier. Uh, There's the Ashes, a bit closer to home, State of Origin, even closer to home. Uh, Many of the movies that we watch uh, finish with showdowns. Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, Simba and Scar, Rocky and just about everyone. (laughs) There have been political uh, showdowns over the years. Even in church history, we see a number of important showdowns. For example, uh, Tuesday of this week was Reformation Day, the day that we remember when Martin Luther uh, nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, which was the spark that lit the the Reformation, one of the most important uh, contests in history. Scripture, as well, is full of contests. Uh, Moses and Pharaoh in Exodus which is really God and Pharaoh, Uh, David and Saul, David and Goliath. There are all these important contests in the Bible. And today in 1 Kings chapter 18, we come to another important showdown. This showdown is nothing less than a divine contest, a God contest. Baal on the one hand, this idol, this false God, this foreign God, And Yahweh, on the other hand, the Lord, the the God of Israel, the God of the Bible. You know, the question at the heart of this passage that we're looking at is, which God is the true God, the real God? How do you know which God is the true God? Uh, Imagine uh, someone asked you that question, maybe a friend or a colleague or a family member or a child. How do you know that your God is the true God? After all, there are lots of different gods. So how do you know yours is the true God? How would you respond to that question? This is the question that we're going to be digging into this morning in 1 Kings chapter 18. Now, if you haven't been around for the last few weeks, we are in a sermon series at the moment, working our way through the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. We're looking at the second half of the book, and we've called the series The Life and Times of Elijah. Now, who was Elijah? Well, Elijah was born about 800 to 900 years before Jesus. Uh, Elijah was a prophet, which means he spoke God's message to God's people. And he did this during a particularly dark period for the people of God. At this point in the history of God's people, uh, they had split into two kingdoms. There'd been a civil war uh, among God's people and you had the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. Now, Elijah mainly ministered in Israel in the north. And the king of Israel during this time was a man named Ahab. Now, Ahab was not a good or a godly king. In fact, chapter 16 says that he was the most evil king that Israel had had so far. Because he, along with his wife Jezebel, had led the people of God into idolatry. He led them into worshipping this foreign false god named Baal. And what we saw happen last week in chapter 17 was that this idolatry led God to inflict a drought upon his people. This was his judgment upon them. Today, as we pick up the story in chapter 18, we're three years down the track and God is about to end the drought. He's about to send Rain, But before he does that, he is going to publicly confront Baal. He is going to publicly humiliate Baal. So that when the rain arrives, the people will know it wasn't sent by Baal, it was sent by Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel. And so that's what we're going to see play out today in this uh, important chapter in God's Word. And we're going to explore this chapter under three headings. Number one, how to serve God faithfully. Number two, how to identify false gods. And then number three, 
how you can know the true God. So let's begin, number one, with how to serve God faithfully. Now, before we get to the the, the God contest at Mount Carmel, we're introduced to this gentleman named Obadiah. Now, we didn't read about Obadiah a moment ago. He's in the first section of the, the chapter, verses 1 to 15, mainly for the sake of time. But I don't want us to miss the lesson that we learn from Obadiah's life. Now, who was this man named Obadiah? Well, he was the palace administrator for King Ahab. He was one of the chief servants of this evil king. But interestingly, Obadiah's name means Yahweh's servant. And sure enough, we're told in verse three that Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. And so Obadiah is this very interesting guy. On the one hand, he serves on the staff of the evil king Ahab. But on the other hand, he's a very sincere, very devout believer in the Lord. And we know Obadiah is a sincere believer because for these last few years, Queen Jezebel has been seeking to exterminate God's prophets, slaughter them, get rid of them, wipe them off the face of the earth. And so Obadiah had used his position to actually shelter 100 of God's prophets in caves, care for them, provide for them. He was a very devout believer in the Lord. And we see this when he meets Elijah. Obadiah has been sent out on an errand uh, by King Ahab and he's out and Elijah appears to him. And uh, Obadiah shows him great respect. He recognises that he's a true prophet of God. And Elijah says to him, go tell your master, go tell King Ahab, Elijah is here. Ahab's been looking for Elijah for these last few years. He's been hiding and Elijah is saying, well, it's time to sort this out. It's time for a showdown. Now, this makes Obadiah a bit nervous. He knows that Elijah has this habit of kind of disappearing, and so he's worried he's going to go and tell King Ahab, and Elijah won't show up, and then he's going to have some explaining to do. And so Elijah assures him, verse 15, as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. So Obadiah agrees, and he delivers the message to King Ahab and sets up the meeting. Now, before we go on to look at what happens when Ahab and Elijah meet, I just want us to think about Obadiah for a moment. Obadiah is very different to Elijah. Elijah's ministry is very public and very confrontational. Everyone knows who Elijah is. Everyone knows what Elijah believes. But Obadiah is a bit different. He works quietly behind the scenes. He works in hidden and subtle ways. But he is no less faithful to God than Elijah. It's a little bit like the different ways that people served in World War II. You know, there were numerous underground resistance movements in World War II, where these people, at great risk to themselves, hid thousands and thousands of Jews. They worked in hidden, subtle, faithful, courageous ways. But then you had the soldiers who stormed the beaches of Normandy, for example. They worked in very obvious, very overt ways, both engaged in the same conflict, but they served in different ways. And it's the same in the kingdom of God. Every Christian is called to be faithful to God, but faithfulness will look different in different contexts. For example, what does faithfulness to Jesus look like in Somalia? where violence against Christians is commonplace? What does it look like in the offices, in the hallways of the Brisbane CBD? What does it look like on a work site where the name of Jesus is is nothing less than a swear word? What does it look like in a family where you are the only genuine believer in Jesus and your family mock you for your beliefs? What does it look like at school or at uni where hardly anyone else around you is a follower of Jesus? When is it right to to publicly speak up, to publicly confront, and when is it right to to work in behind-the-scenes kind of ways? The point is that Christian faithfulness does not always come in one flavour, that there are different ways to faithfully serve God. You don't have to be Elijah or Martin Luther Or John Knox, you don't have to have this kind of public confrontational approach. In fact, you probably won't. God, this is not how he normally calls us to serve him. 
God calls us to serve him where he has placed us in faithful ways. To be faithful wherever he has placed us. And this is what we learn from the faithful servant Obadiah. How to serve God faithfully. But this brings us to our second point. How to identify false gods. Verses 16 to 29. And here we come to the the part of the passage that was read for us earlier. We come to the the contest on Mount Carmel, the the meeting between uh, evil King Ahab and the prophet Elijah. Now look what Ahab says to Elijah when he meets him. Is that you, you troubler of Israel? You see, from the king's perspective, the problem in Israel, the problem with the drought, it's Elijah. He's the reason that everyone is suffering so much. But Elijah has a different view of the situation. Look at verse 18. I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. In other words, the real problem here, O King Ahab, is you. It's your idolatry. It's your uh, disobedience to God. It's your worship of Baal. And so you've got these two different sides. You've got these two different perspectives. How are you going to settle it? Well, Elijah suggests a contest. He suggests a showdown. Uh, uh, The prophets of Baal on one side and Elijah, the Lord's prophet, on the other side. Sounds good to King Ahab. Uh, He spreads the word. The people of Israel gather on Mount Carmel, which was a significant site both for worship of Baal and worship of the Lord. And, And everything is ready for this showdown. Now, before the contest begins, Elijah stands up to address God's wayward people. And he says this to them, verse 21. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Elijah calls on the people to get decisive. They've kind of been wavering between two opinions. They've been trying to worship Baal and the Lord. They've had a foot in both camps. And in fact, the word to waver literally means to limp. Their attempt to have the best of both worlds, it has left them crippled. And let's be honest, we can live this way as well. When it comes to our relationship with God, uh, so many of us, myself included, have tried to live on the fence, to, to live with a foot in each camp, a little bit of God and a little bit of the world. And it hasn't led us to joy and flourishing. It's led us miserable left us miserable and limping. Here's the way uh, an author by the name of Ray Ortland Sr. puts it. He says, half-hearted Christians are the most miserable people of all. They know enough to feel guilty, but they haven't gone far enough with Christ to be happy. And Elijah is saying to the people and he's saying to us, make up your mind. Choose your God. Get off the fence. If the Lord is God, follow him wholeheartedly. If Baal is God, then follow him. To put it in more modern terms, maybe to to use our more modern idols, if money is your God, then get after it. Do what you have to do to get it. Lie, steal, cheat. See how it works out. If the approval of people is your God, then chase after it. Do whatever it takes. Do whatever you have to do to earn people's approval. If beauty is your God, make your whole life about the way that you look. If sex is your God, pursue it. Make all your fantasies come true. And see how these things work out for you. See where they lead you in life. If Baal is God, follow him. But if the Lord is God, if he is the one true God, then follow him. Get off the fence. Get decisive. Stop wavering. This is the call of Elijah to the people and to us. Now, how do the people respond, people of Israel? Verse 21, but the people said nothing. Probably was an awkward silence. They're silent. They're mute. But not for too long, because the contest is now about to begin. With everyone present and ready, 450 prophets of Baal on one side, Elijah on the other. Uh, Elijah then explains the rules. Each party is going to take a bull, they're going to chop it up, they're going to place it on the altar. And then verse 24, 
Then you call on the name of your God, Elijah says, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire, he is God. The God who consumes the sacrifice by fire, he is God. And so the the contest with the rules set, it, it gets underway. And the prophets of Baal go first. They set their sacrifice on the altar. They begin to cry out to Baal. They even start to dance around the altar. But there's no answer. Verse 26, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And no one answered because no one was there. These prophets of Baal are a little bit like my kids when they uh, take the toy phone. They put it to their ear and they talk very loudly, very confidently. They have a very long conversation, but no one's on the line. And this charade went on all day long. Verse 26, they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon, calling, dancing, crying out. Now, I must admit, as an Aussie, and especially as an Aussie cricket fan, um, I kind of like what Elijah does next. He begins to sledge them. (laughs) He begins to throw shade at them. Look at verse 27. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought. He's daydreaming. He's uh, scrolling through Facebook. Or busy. Now, the NIV, which is the translation we use, it's, it's polite here. It's more polite than Elijah. This is literally a euphemism for on the loo. He's relieving himself. He's occupied. Or he's traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and needs to wake up. Elijah's mocking them. Now, what do they do? What's their response? Well, we're told in verse 28, they begin to slash themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. But there was no response, no one answered, no one paid attention. This story is is humorous, but it's also tragic. It's sad. But it's also illuminating for us. You know, it shows us the nature of false worship. It shows us how to identify false gods. For starters, false gods, we see here, require strenuous performance to please them. These prophets are crying out all day to Baal. They're dancing around the altar. Why? To perform for Baal, to please him, to placate him, to somehow convince him to do what they wanted him to do. Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, they go before their God to perform. When they go before their God, they don't go as a friend. They don't go as short of a relationship. They go to perform. They have to perform. They have to do their dance steps. You have to impress this God. You have to do everything just right so he has to answer your prayer. Now, I wonder if that's the way you think about God. I wonder if that's the way you relate to God. This is not the way the God of the Bible relates to us. This is how false gods work. This is how idols work. And if your life feels like one big dance, if it feels like you're constantly performing, it could be that you've taken your eyes off the true God. It could be that you've forgotten the gospel and you've turned towards idols and false gods. False gods require strenuous performance to please them. Secondly, what we see here is that false gods lead us to harm and destruction. You know, these prophets of Baal, as we saw a moment ago, they get so worked up that they they slash themselves, that they, they cut themselves until their blood flows. And isn't this what false gods do to us as well? Isn't this where idolatry leads us? Not to life and flourishing, but to harm? No, I don't think anyone's put this better than David Foster Wallace. Now, he was an American author and novelist, not a Christian, not a believer, but he understood the insidious nature of idolatry. Here's what he says. It won't be on the screen, so listen carefully. 
He says, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships, says this atheist. The only choice we get is what to worship. And an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive, he says. Listen to this. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power. You will feel weak and afraid and you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart. You will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on. Now, do you see what he's saying? False gods, idols, don't give us satisfaction and meaning. They take these things from us. They steal from us. Recently, I was uh, listening to an interview with Scott Pape, uh, the, the barefoot investor. Now, it wasn't about finance. It was actually about being a dad. And he t- told, the, told the story of this older dad that he had spoken to. Uh, and this older dad said to him, I can't even talk about the time when my kids were little because I just wasn't around. He says, I missed seeing them grow up because I was just always working. I was so driven to earn more, to buy bigger, to get better, to keep up with everyone else that I neglected what was most important to me. And that is where idolatry leads us. Leads us down the trail of dissatisfaction, discontentment, which leads us to harm and destruction. This is where false gods lead us. But thankfully, it's not the end of the story because Elijah hasn't had his turn yet. And this leads us to our third and final point, which is how to know the true God. Now, when it's uh, Elijah's turn, uh, he ratchets it up a couple of knots. He he ups the ante. He, He actually digs a trench around his altar and then he begins to pour water over the altar. And he does it so much that the the trench around it fills up with water. And and then, rather than kind of running around and dancing around the altar, Elijah just prays a simple prayer. Verses 36 to 37, he says, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. In other words, he said, the God has been faithful to his people, faithful to his promises. Let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Elijah's prayer is 30 seconds at most compared to a whole day of ranting and raving. Friends, genuine prayer isn't about length or volume or eloquence. It's about praying to God with humility and with sincerity, being honest before him. Now, what happens? God responds to Elijah's simple prayer with fire. Fire uh, not only burns up the sacrifice, but it actually consumes the altar. It it consumes the water in the trench and nothing is left but scorched earth. And, And we read in verse 39, when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The God contest is over. There is a very clear winner. Now, our Bible reading ended at this point in the story, and it might be nice if this was where the chapter ended. If it was a Hollywood movie, this is where it would end. But it doesn't. There's one more section in this story, and on the surface, it's a bit confronting for you and I. But it actually shows us how we can recognize the true God. And what it shows us is that the true God is a God of justice a God of judgment. We're told in verse 40 that after the contest ends, Elijah commands the prophets of Baal uh, to be taken into the Kishon Valley and to be slaughtered there. 450 prophets of Baal are killed. Now, what are we to make of this? It isn't very democratic, is it? 
And some of you might say, well, that's because it's in the Old Testament. You know, the, the God of the Old Testament, he, he's, he's a God of judgment. But don't worry, when you get to the New Testament, God is a God of grace. That's a, a common view, but it just doesn't work. See, the problem is that the Old Testament repeatedly describes God as compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin again and again. And then when you turn to the New Testament, it certainly is not devoid of judgment. Jesus taught on the reality of hell more than anyone else. There are some terrible scenes of judgment in the book of Revelation. The whole Bible is clear that there is a judgment to come, that the true God is a God of love and justice. And friends, how could he not be? How could God be truly loving but have no intention or ability to deal with the evil and the wickedness that has ravaged our world? With human trafficking, with war, with corruption, with greed. We all want to live in a world without these things. We all want these things to end. And the Bible promises us that God will bring justice that God will do what is right, that God will put an end to evil. Not because God is hateful, but precisely because God is loving. Here's the way an author by the name of Becky, uh, Becky Pippet puts it. She says, God's wrath is not a cranky explosion, but his settled opposition to the cancer which is eating out the insides of the human race he loves with his whole being. And so this story teaches us that the God of the Bible, the true God, is a God of judgment. But here's where the problem is. The evil in our world is not just out there. It's in here. And this is where this story becomes even better news for us because it shows us that the true God is not simply a God who brings judgment. The true God, the God of the Bible, is also a God who bears our judgment. You know, this contest in in 1 Kings 18, it it actually points us forward to another contest many years later. You know, the time uh, that God did something even more amazing. He didn't send fire to consume a sacrifice. He sent his son to be the sacrifice. The sacrifice for our sin and our evil. See, Jesus Christ came into this world and he claimed to be God. He showed us he was God through his teaching and through his miracles. But, but not everyone was convinced. I mean, how can we know that Jesus is the true God? How can we be sure? Well, it's time for another God contest on another mountain, this time on a hill outside Jerusalem called Calvary. And Jesus explained the rules before the contest. He said, I'm going to be killed, but three days later, I will rise from the dead. And sure enough, Jesus was put to death on a Roman cross. His dead body was placed in a tomb. And just like Elijah's sacrifice, which was totally covered in water, it looked totally impossible that Jesus would rise from the dead. And for three days, nothing happened. It looked like Jesus had lost the contest. But then just as he said, three days later, he walked out of the tomb. He was raised to life to prove to us once and for all that he has paid for our sin, that he has borne our judgment, that he has defeated death and he has won the God contest once and for all. And now we can say, Jesus, he is God. Jesus, he is God. And this is how we know once and for all the answer to the question. How do you know that your God is the true God? The answer is the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus has defeated our greatest enemy and Jesus has given us the greatest gift. Gift of restored relationship with God and hope beyond the grave. And the death and the resurrection of Jesus shows us that unlike false gods and idols, Jesus does not require strenuous performance from us to please him. Instead, we can now approach God confidently because of Jesus' perfect performance on our behalf. We can rest in Jesus' finished work on our behalf. We don't have to perform and dance around to please God. God is already pleased with us in Jesus. 
That the message of the gospel, the message of Christianity is not obey so that you can be accepted. It's you are accepted in Christ and so now you can obey. Now you can live to please the God who has purchased you. And unlike all other idols and false gods, Jesus does not lead us into harm and destruction. Jesus leads us into flourishing and into life. He said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, Jesus is the only God in the world who if you gain him will satisfy you and if you fail him will forgive you. And so my question to you is what more do you want from God? He has sent his son to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. He has sent his son to give you the gift that you have not earned. And he has sent his son to prove to you once and for all that he is the one true God and that he is for you and not against you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for that contest on Calvary over 2,000 years ago when it looked like the powers of evil and death had won. But then three days later, Jesus rose again, triumphing over them and extending to us the greatest gift in the universe. And so Lord, where we have been wavering, where we have been looking to, to false gods that cannot satisfy and that do not forgive us when we fail, Lord, help us to look to Jesus, the one who has borne our judgment, paid our penalty and given us the gift of life. Lord, help us to put ourselves wholly into his good and gracious hands. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I invite you to stand as we go out in song and with these words from 1 Timothy chapter 1. To the King of ages, immortal and invisible, the only God, be honour and glory now and forever. Amen.